we can uh, start sharing. Um, good. So um, for this uh, second uh, talk today, we have the pleasure to have uh, Jason Burstock from uh, City University of New York, who will uh, give a talk about uh, random graphs. So around erdos rainy type of random graphs, if I understood correctly, and the applications to Coxeter groups. So we are listening to you. OK, thank you very much for, um, to, to the organizers and to Russ uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm excited to, uh, to present to a crowd that I mostly don't know. So very, very few screens are on, too. So if anybody wants to turn on their screen, only if I've never met you before should you turn on your screen, which I think means everybody but Russ. Um, so um, yeah, I have several, I guess, affiliations listed here because I'm on sabbatical at, at Barnard this semester and I'm normally at CUNY um, and I'm a Simons Fellow, so I should thank the Simons Foundation too. Um, okay, so uh, what I want to do today is talk about um, sort of, I'll talk more about Coxeter groups um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a specific class of Coxeter groups, but I want to bring together uh, different areas, in particular uh, Coxeter groups and geometric group theory. So this talk will go sort of back and forth between um, between sort of random graphs and, and some sort of probability theory, as well as to some stuff in group theory and some geometry. And I'll kind of flip back and forth between between different parts. And so, um, you know, if you if you see something you haven't seen and, and you're confused about it, please feel free to interrupt because I know a lot of this will be um, somewhat foreign to some of you. Um, so. So I'll start though with something that, that I think everybody knows uh, in this in this in this crowd, which is um, the erdos renyi random graph. Um, so so uh, the definition of erdos renyi uh, is that GNP is the probability space of graphs uh, of n vertices where each pair of vertices is connected by an edge uh, independently with probability p. Uh, so. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll often talk about things asymptotically almost surely, which, which for me means that, uh, that if you have a class of graphs that have the property that, that, um, that sort of they fill up most of GNP as n goes to, as um, the probability that the graph is in that class uh, as n goes to uh, infinity, um, the probability that you're in that class goes to one, then we say the property holds asymptotically almost surely. Um, okay, so. Uh, so, so let me start with the classic theorem of erdos renyi So, um, so, uh, so everyone knows that there's a sharp threshold for connectivity. So, what exactly did they prove? So, Erdős and Renyi proved that if you have um, any epsilon greater than zero and any sufficiently large n, then um, if you take a probability p of n which is bigger than uh, one plus epsilon times log n over n, um, and you have a graph that's in GNP, then it's asymptotically almost surely connected. Um, and and it, so above some threshold, you always get connectivity. And if you're below that threshold, so if you have any probability that's um, bounded away from, from log n over n, so it's less than one minus epsilon log n over n, um, then, then it's uh, asymptotically almost surely disconnected. Uh, and, and, I, and I ran a bunch of computations to sort of, you know, as I was, I'm sort of, you know, in the last 10 years, sort of new to probability theory. And so as I was kind of learning this for myself, I decided to run some computer simulations and see what a threshold theorem looks like. Um, and so, so here's a, you know, here's a threshold theorem that everyone knows. And here's sort of experimental, uh, you know, computations that shows what that is. So you see that there's actually kind of a, a large range, you know, or I don't know if it's large or not large, but, but you know, there's this range of, of constants, um, you know, Asymptotically, it's right at one that this threshold occurs. But as you run computations, there's this kind of tight band as you vary the number of vertices. Um, but that band sort of goes between 0.8 and 1.4 to go from not being connected to being connected. Okay. So, um, all right. So, so that's sort of the the probability theory that I. So my goal in this talk is to explain to you that there's some sort of geometric group theory analogs of of this theorem. So in the context of Coxer groups, I'm going to Kind of introduce, improve some analogs of this type of threshold theorem. So, in order to do that, let me let me turn to groups for a minute, um, and uh, and talk about the notion of groups as metric spaces. So, um, so so given any finally generated group, um, so for instance, any of the Cox groups we saw in the previous talk, there's a way of building a, a metric on that group. So 
so Russ just, when he was talking about the group, it was, it was, you know, he was really talking about the metric on the group. Uh, he was calling it the, the Cayley, the Cayley graph and Cayley complex um, associated to the, um, to the group, which just means that you fix a group and you fix a particular set of generators for that group. Um, and given that particular set of generators, you define the distance between two elements to be um, really the, the shortest length of a word representing um, representing the product of those two. Well, well, one of those elements times the inverse of the other. Um, so in other words, in the, if you've drawn the Cayley graph, so if you've put down you know, a vertex for every element of the group and an edge every time you, uh, connecting two elements that are connected by a generator, then uh, this word metric is just the length of the shortest path in that, um, in that graph. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the word metric. And um, for me, uh, a res so um, a property of the word metric that I'm particularly interested in is that uh, it turns out that, um, that as you change, like as you change generating sets, the metrics change. And so, um, so, so if you, you know, we were talking about Coxeter groups or in the previous talk, Russ was talking about Coxeter groups with a very particular generating set. As you change generating set, for instance, with respect to random walks, like you don't in general know any information. Um, and with respect to the, the um, with respect to the metric on the group, sort of lots changes as you change the generating set. But, um, but a, a sort of a property that geometric group theorists study is actually, even though the metric changes, it only ch it changes distances, but only up to uniformly bounded multiplicative additive, additive error. So that's called a quasi isometry. And so, so no matter what word metric, what no matter which generating set finest generating set you take on a particularly finely generated group, the, the metrics change, but they change in kind of a controlled way. So let me show you a picture of what that actually looks like in real life, which is you know you could take the the integers, um, you know the simplest infinite group, and you could take it with different generating sets. So in the top, I've taken the generating set, you know s equals uh, just, you know, plus or minus one. And in the bottom, I've got a different generating set, maybe I'll call it T, which is uh, plus or minus uh, two and plus or minus three. Okay, and, and when, I, when I draw those graphs, they're different graphs, and they'll have different behaviors if you, for, for lots of properties. But if you kind of bore your eyes when you look at those, you know, you kind of squint your eyes, they both kind of roughly look like a line. And that, that's the property of a quasi-isometry, is that it's kind of the, pro it's the property of can you differentiate, if you can't differentiate these things by squinting, then, the, then they're probably quasi-isometric. And for geometric group theorists, we like things that are invariant under quasi-isometries because it means you actually get a bona fide theorem about a group. So you can prove something that's about the group and not a group with a particular generating set. Um, so, so let me tell you now, so now that's sort of a little bit of group theory. Let me now turn to geometry for a second. Um, so a geometric property uh, that, that that I like because it's a quasi isometry invariant is this notion called divergence. So ignore any of the words on this slide for a second. And, and let me just show you geometrically what, what's going on here. So, so this is what divergence means. So uh, the divergence of a group means you study, you think about a, a bi-infinite geodesic inside your space. And then you ask the question, well, fix a point in the middle of that bi-infinite geodesic um, and remove the ball around that bi-infinite geodesic of some fixed radius. And then say, okay, hey, what's the shortest path now when I remove that ball? It, it may disconnect the space, in which case I'm not really going to think about those. Those are um, those can be understood in a different way. But 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 I'm going to sort of assume that you can still connect it. So I'm assuming it's a one-ended geodesic metric space. And then you kind of ask, how long is that path? Um, and it turns out that by studying the asymptotics of 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 that of that divergence function of how long it takes to evolve, avoid larger and larger balls around a, a given point in the middle, um, you get a very interesting quasi-isometry invariant of, of a space. Um, and I'll, I'll, I want to think about this in particular for um, Cayley graphs. And so this will give me interesting invariants of the, of the group. Okay, so, um, so, let me, so let me, I'm, I'm going to kind of show you some more pictures in a minute, but let me just state um, a, few, a few applications so that you can sort of see where this gets used elsewhere. Um, so I don't really want to talk about any of these applications today. I'll say, well, I'll maybe say briefly something about the first one, which is this property is useful because, um, you know, one of the fundamental questions in geometric group theory is uh, classify all groups up to quasi-isometry. And having quasi-isometry invariants gives us a way to start to classify groups. Um, and actually, let me just 
let me mention one other pro property, which is sort of related to the, the talk we just heard, is uh, this fourth property I wrote, understanding the behavior of random walks. So, um, you know, there's a there's a a, a very nice um, there's a very nice paper of um, uh, let's see. So there's there's a couple of results about this, but um, so there's a, there's a nice paper of of, of Ma uh, Mathieu and Sisto where they kind of showed that if you have a random walk and you have some kind of superlinear divergence, then you can control some of the behavior of random walks. So random walks can be controlled to some extent in the in the presence of of um, uh, in the in the presence of some some superlinear divergence. Um, and then there's a recent paper of, of um, Gold, uh, Goldberg and Sisto, um, where they show they show even further that somehow if you have um, random walks and you they, they well they, they've sort of initiated a study of random walks up to quasi isometry. So if you have sort of quasi isometric groups, to what extent can you control um, the structure of random walks? And they kind of show that certain central limit theorems um, are kind of invariant under quasi isometry. So that's sort of I think exciting. Uh, new results uh, relating random walks and, and geometric group theory. It's not what I'm going to talk about today, but but it sort of it arises out of the same family of sort of techniques. Um, May I ask a question about uh, sure. divergence? Um, yeah, please. Because on on the previous slide you mentioned the def definition of divergence and the fact that it is a, a quasi isometry invariant. Uh, something that is not very clear to me, uh, but I just want to be sure that it's true. So I, because you say that it's quasi isometry invariant, but something that is not clear to me is that it's uh, invariant under uh, which choice of uh, B infinite geodesic you make. Like, is it just a property of the space, or is it a property of a space endowed with a particular particular choice of a B infinite uh, geodesic? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Actually, so it it very much depends on the choice of G -desic. Um So so it depends on the choice of G -desic. I'll often talk about the divergence of a group, which means Look at the worst, you know, look at the divergence in the, look at the geodesic in the group whose divergence is behaving the worst in the group and study that. Um, so yes, that, 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 that's a good point. So as I stated, it depends on the geodesic. And then, and then when I talk about it for a group, I'll mean, I'll mean the one that has the largest growth. Okay, thanks. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, okay, so, so, so let, me, let me turn now to a couple of just concrete examples. So the first concrete example is Euclidean space. So, so we know that in Euclidean space, the divergence of Rn is linear because we know that the what the perimeter of a circle is. So if you take any geodesic in this case, um, then you know what the perimeter of a circle is. So as you so you can kind of avoid um, you can avoid large balls circled around a point on that geodesic by just going around a circle of, of linear radius. So that's the simplest possible example. It turns out that's kind of there's a bunch of examples um, that are of that vein. So um, so there's other groups. So um, you know Rn is not a well. So Rn is not a finally generated group, but Rn is quasi asymmetric to uh, Z to the N. So the free abelian group of rake N and R to the N are quasi asymmetric. So that so this Euclidean space example is really can be thought about as the finally generated group, the free abelian group on N generators. Um, but there's other groups that have uh, linear divergence. So the simplest next family is if you take the direct product of two infinite groups, that also the same kind of way of avoiding things um, works and those have linear divergence. Um, and you know, the first guess is maybe that's the only type of, of um, linear divergence. That's not true in general, but but it's um, there's a there's a whole family of of theorems um, uh, where you say, hey, if I restrict to this particular class of groups, the only ones with linear divergence are direct products. Um, and so there's a theorem of Donnie Thomas combined with um, a theorem that I proved with with Hagen and Sisto that shows that in the family of right angle toxic groups, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, they have linear divergence if and only if they're direct products. So, um, so that's one family of things with, with uh, linear divergence. There's other families. So um, if you have any group that satisfies a law, so nilpotent groups, solvable groups, you know, infinite Burnside groups, those all satisfy law. Turns out those things also all have linear divergence. Um, and one other family that's not direct products, um, but, but sort of, uh, but has linear divergence is if you look at, um, uh, if you look at groups that have an infinite order element in their center. So um, they don't have to, it doesn't have to be a direct product, but if you have an infinite order element in their center, then those things also have linear divergence. Okay, so, so these are some examples with linear divergence. There's other ones as well. Um, but now let's sort of 
think about something a little bit different, which is um, which is hyperbolic space. So um, so we saw a bunch of nice hyperbolic pictures in the last one. This is sort of Escher's famous circle limit picture, which is really a um, a picture of the Poincaré hyperbolic plane. Um, and it turns out that the divergence in the hyperbolic plane is exponential uh, because the perimeter of a circle of of, of radius r is is this hyperbolic is hyperbolic sign. So, um, so here's some kind of family of pictures that, that illustrates this. Um, so what do you do? So you can fix some by infinite geodesic, maybe the straight line across the circle. Remember, geodesics in the hyperbolic plane are are um, lines that are, are are you know arcs of circles that are that meet the circle at infinity, that meet this boundary circle at a 90 degree angle. So for instance, the straight uh, diameter is a geodesic. And then I could you know, fix my base point to be maybe the middle of that geodesic, and I could look at how long paths are um, that try to go around that. And if I look at paths that try to go around that, um, uh, sorry, I gotta do this up here, two, three. So you can see that like, as I move that red arc out, the number of angels and devils that it goes through, which is sort of a way of estimate, which is a way of calculating the length of that path, um, it's growing exponentially. So you can kind of see the exponential growth, um, uh, the so the exponential growth so the, the really the exponential divergence um, in the in the sort of number of angels and devils that this red path crosses through. Okay, so um, so those are kind of oh, one more picture. So those um, those are kind of the two extremes. And there's a there's an old conjecture of Gromov's from 1992 that if you had a non-positivity curve space, um, then the divergence is always one of those two things. So you kind of look at the worst geodesic in your space. And it's either linear and fits into this sort of nice family, or it's exponential. Um, okay, so that was this conjecture of, uh, of Gromov's from '92. Turns out that it's false. So Gersten, like two years later, found a counterexample. Um, he said there's no dichotomy. In fact, he constructed some very explicit three-dimensional non-positive curve space that had quadratic divergence. So, so he found some explicit examples, um, but but it still left open the question of well what exactly are the examples like are there many of them what do they look like um, and so you know Gersten's theorem was just the beginning of a of kind of what became a, a, a sort of a mini industry of showing that lots of different groups that arise in geometric group theory um, so or in, in low in really in low dimensional topology um, lots of really important groups and spaces have quadratic divergence so in a certain sense. From the point of view of people that study low dimensional topology, these kind of quadratic divergence examples are pretty common, um, even though you know Gromov thought you know maybe there were none of them. And so, so, um, so, so it sort of leaves open the question of of well, you know, what is the world of groups that have quadratic divergence? What what exists between linear and exponential? Kind of what are the things? What are the types of things can we find? Um, okay, so. Um, so let's now turn to, to the really named subject of this talk, which is right angle coxeter groups. Um, so for so for right angle so right angle coxeter groups um, are this particular family of, of coxeter groups that have a, a very simple presentation. So um, as Russ mentioned, these things kind of come from thinking about reflections and hyperplanes. Um, and, and so they have this very simple form. So you have some finite collection of generators. Um, and each generator is order two because they come from, we, we want to think of them as coming from reflections. So each generator is order two. And we have a very particular type of relation. So the right angledness means that those two reflections meet in 90 degree angles. Okay. In other words, uh, if you have any pair of generators, either, either they don't commute um, or if they, if they, the, or um, the only other, so they may not commute, but if they do, um, if they have some relation, the only relations I'm allowed to that I'm going to include are some of the some of the generators commute. Um, okay, so for every pair of vertices, um, they either either there's no relation or there's this commuting relation. Okay, so um, actually, right. So there's the order twoness, and then there's this I, either they either they um, sometimes I throw in this relation that they commute. Um, so he would, Russ was considering a more general class of coxeter groups where you could have kind of, you know, AB to a higher order power was allowed to equal one. In the right angle case, we don't do that. We just have AB squared um, is equal to one, which, which is the same as AB equals BA, um, or, we, or we don't have any relation. So, so this is, this is this, yes, is there a question? When you say edge here for the related, so you're talking about the coxeter diagram? 
Yeah. So, so, so let me, I'm going to draw some explicit pictures. So, so here's some explicit examples. I just want to make people. Okay. You didn't define it. So, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to draw a picture right now. So here's how you get a Cox. Here's how you, here's one way to represent a writing of Coxeter group. You draw a graph. Okay. And in the graph, I put vertices for every generator in my uh, writing of Coxeter group. So I, I put, so like in this picture on the left, I've got four vertices. So there's four generators. In fact, each of these, each of these um, three pictures here has four vertices. So these are all four generator groups. Um, and each one of the generators is order two. So in each one of these groups, I have, I have a bunch of uh, Z mod two Zs. And then I put in an edge if, um, if those two generators commute. So on the left here, I've got um, no edges. I just have four vertices. And that's the group uh, Z mod two Z, free product Z mod two Z, free product Z mod two Z, free product Z mod two Z. So this is essentially, you know, you know Russ started his talk with the, with the graph um, consisting of just three vertices. So it was a free product of three copies of Z mod 2Z. Um, so that's kind of, um, you know, one of the simplest graphs you could draw. Um, the other end of the spectrum is, hey, you could put in all possible edges. So if I have, if I have a graph with four vertices and all possible edges, I draw the simplex, then that's the free abelian group um, consisting of four copies of, of Z, mod, Z mod 2Z, but now I'm taking the direct product instead of the free product of it. Okay, so so writing a cock group is one way of interpolating between um, free products and direct products. And, and so the one sort of fancier example I drew here is if I draw a square, okay, well then you'll notice there's um, these two vertices that I colored in blue. Well, those don't share an edge with each other, okay? So those generate a copy of Z mod two Z cross Z mod two Z, uh, an infinite dihedral group. And these two red vertices, generate an infinite dihedral group. And the blue vertices and the red vertices are kind of joined together, so they commute with each other, okay? So you kind of get this direct product of this infinite dihedral group with this infinite dihedral group, and that's exactly what the group is, okay? So, so you can sort of write down, um, well, in these, in these examples, you can write down in a very simple way exactly what the group is from this, from this graph. And in general, you can write down the presentation explicitly in terms of the graph. Um, and one comment that, that I wanted to make actually is that um, there's a theorem, uh, there's sort of a folk theorem uh, it's attributed to, to different people, but the, the folk theorem says that if you have um, uh, the, the writing of Coxeter group, uh, two writing of Coxeter groups are isomorphic, if and only if the presentation graphs are isomorphic. So, um, so from the graph, the, the graph you know, uniquely determines the group and vice versa. All right. So let me show you one other uh, family of, of graphs. So here's three other graphs. Um, and, and I put these together because these are, these are sort of three graphs that I, that I'll, that I quite like. Um, so let, let me first, actually, let me focus on this one for a second, this hexagon. So this hexagon, it turns out, is the beginning of a very nice family of, of graphs, which are, um, which are just, if you take uh, any, if you take any uh, polygon with at least five sides, it turns out, that, that generates um, generates a, a a a group which tessellates the hyperbolic plane. So um, actually, I was very happy that I got Russ's slide yesterday because I didn't know about this program, and I was able to generate this very cool picture using it. Um, so so this is so here in the middle. Um, let's see. I think I even highlighted it. Um, here's my hexagon. Okay. So there there's the hexagon, and then um, I can draw. Let me make this a little bit thicker and draw this in black. So here I can draw some, you know, here's a geodesic that kind of goes along one of the edges. That's one of the generators of the group. So I can take this hexagon and I can reflect it in that. And if I reflect it in that, I get, um, it's a little, if you're not familiar with this, it's a little hard to see, but here, this is actually what you get. So you get this. Um, should I shade it in? Um, you know, you get this hexagon here. Um, so, so that's sort of how the reflections work. Um, so, and, and you can kind of then, you can extend in that way and you can see that, that by, by applying these different, um, by, by applying these reflections in these kind of bi-infinite geodesics that, 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 that kind of extend the edge of the hexagon, you end up getting this nice tessellation of the hyperbolic plane. Um, so so this, is, this, is the, this is what you get in general if you take any, if you take any polygon of um, 
if you take any polygon with at least five sides, then the right angle coxal group is, is this uh, nice hyperbolic group. Um, okay, so that's one family of examples. Um, the other two examples I drew here, well, I drew this one because you see these triangles here. So the triangles we know how to recognize from the above picture, those are just copies of, um, you know, a free abelian group uh, made of three copies of this, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's the direct product of three copies of Z mod two Z. Um, and, and I've got a bunch of these things, which I think of as sort of leaves um, in a book, and they, and they, all, um, they all have this common spine, which is this uh, direct product of two copies of Z mod two Z. So really, if you think about the outsides of these spines, that gives me a, um, that gives me a free group, right? None of those vertices on the outside commute with each other. It's a free product of a bunch of um, copies of Z mod two Z. And then th those are each direct, it's then the direct product of that free group with this um, copy of Z mod two, a direct product Z mod two that's in the middle. So, so that's sort of another thing that you can do. And then this group on the outside, um, turns out it's a beautiful group. It's, it's, um, it's the fundamental group of a three manifold, um, of a non-hyperbolic three manifold. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll come back and talk a little bit more about, well, th this type of group ends up showing up a lot in the things that I, that I wanna think about. Um, but one, one nice way that you could think about this is you could think about this group is if you kind of ignore, if I cross out these bottom two edges for a minute, um, then you could think of this sort of top, um, let me highlight this. You could think of this, there's this, copy here, oh, this is too thick. Um, let's do it in maybe this color. There's this copy here of K23, okay, which is, uh, which is the free product of, which, which as a group gives me a copy of, um, of, a, of a infinite dihedral group coming from the top and bottom vertices with something that's a virtually a free group coming from the three vertices in the middle. So there's this interesting uh, infinite dihedral group there and there's actually, there's another, I'll, I'll draw a similar picture later, but um, there's another copy of, um, of K23 here. And I've kind of amalgamated those two things together along this, uh, along this square in the middle. So this is kind of an amalgam of two copies of, of, of a product of a free group of, of a infant dihedral group with a, well, so virtually Z with a virtually um, free group. Um, okay, so I'll come back and talk more about that type of example in the middle, but, but you can see already that these, Groups get very complicated, and you know uh, these right angle coxal groups. Even though the even though the presentation seems extremely simple, is a very rich family. So Ian Eagles, you know, a large part of why he won this you know multi million dollar Millennium Prize is because he proved that every uh, hyperbolic three manifold group is a subgroup of a right angle coxal group. So that that's um, that was sort of one of the key parts of his theorem. Uh, did you have a question? Um... I, yeah, I have one uh, about the, um, the kind of book example, like at the middle center. Uh, is yeah. it correct to say that uh, it can be described as follows? Like uh, we have uh, N copies of, uh, where we have like for each sheet of paper, we have a copy of uh, Z mod two to the power three. In each of these copies, we have a, a subgroup, which is uh, Z mod two to the power two. And we take the amalgamated product of all these groups relative to this subgroup. It's uh, one correct description. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a bunch of yeah. There's a bunch of different descriptions, and, and depending on you know what you want to do, you know different descriptions can be useful. So yeah, that's 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 a great description of it. Okay. So um so the, so so those are some examples. Okay. So now um so now we have this connection right between between groups and graphs um and so. So the, 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 the next thing to ask then is, is if I look at the graph, well, the graph completely encodes the group. So you can say that all the group theoretic properties are encoded in the graph. But really what I wanna ask is, hey, if I pick a particular kind of graph theoretic property that I'm interested in, what does that tell me about, about the group? So the simplest example is, um, is that if the graph is a clique, then the group that you get is finite, okay? And it turns out that's, and that's, a, that's an if and only if, and that, that one's pretty simple to check. So, so if I want to if I want to figure out what the graph is, what the group is, uh, whether it's finite, I can determine that completely in terms of whether or not the the um, the graph is a clique. Um, so the next example actually is a is a is a bit harder. It's a it's a theorem of um, uh, Shantz and uh, and and Mike Mahalik and Steve Shantz. Um, so they prove that if you want to know does my group split over a finite group, it turns out that that also has a nice geometric you know, or combinatorial description, which is 
if I can find a separating clique in the graph, um, so for instance, in those leaves example, that edge in the middle separates everything. Therefore, the whole group splits over this, um, splits over that, splits over that finite group. Um, so if you have the if you have the group, then knowing that that um, that description gives you splitting over a finite group um, is not that hard to prove. Proving the converse is a much harder theorem. Showing that this, these are the only ways that these things split over a finite group is if I can see it visually in terms of the graph. Uh, that's the content of the theorem. Um, uh, so uh, the group is a direct product if and only if the graph is a join. Again, one direction of that is easy, uh, knowing that that the only way that the group can arise as a direct product is if you see it in the graph. Uh, is 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 not so hard, but it's a little bit more. Um, and uh, you know, the last property that I want to talk about is this: um, the group is hyperbolic if and only if it contains no induced square. So let me just give you a quick definition of hyperbolicity. So hyperbolic means, um, um, so a group is hyperbolic if if you draw any geodesic triangle in the group, then it has the property that, um, that does not look like a very good triangle, sorry. Um, it just don't look like very good geodesic. But anyways, if you take, you know, some geodesic triangle in your group, um, then, uh, then it has the property that uh, that if you take any two of the any two of the uh, edges and you take the let's see if this oh I didn't choose a okay so this graph would not be delta hyperbolic because the neighborhoods you know, I, I didn't choose a big enough neighborhood but if I chose a slightly bigger neighborhood of each one of these edges uh, then this has the property that the neighborhood of two of the edges completely contains the third edge. Okay, so if there exists a constant, so that if you take the kind of constant size neighborhood of two of the edges, it contains the third edge for any geodesic triangle, then the graph is what's called hyperbolic, or it's called delta hyperbolic if you want to, if you care about what the constant is. So this is sort of, um, you know, the examples of the hyperbolic plane is an example of a hyperbolic space, um, of, of a delta hyperbolic space, and you can compute the constant explicitly. Um, but there's sort of, there's this nice generalization that there's lots of interesting metric spaces that have that property. Um, but are not uh, but are not the homogeneous hyperbolic space, and um, so that's a property that's been studied a lot in the last 30 years in, in geometry and geometric group theory. And it turns out that that property is completely characterized. This is a theorem of Musong's um, by whether or not the presentation graph has an induced square. So it, um, if there's no induced square, then it's hyperbolic. If there's an induced square, the induced square gives me this copy of z mod 2z, which it turns out is an obstruction to hyperbolicity. So so having an induced square is an obstruction to hyperbolicity. The fact that having no induced square implies hyperbolic is, is a very deep theorem due to Mousson. Um, okay, so, um, so so hyperbolicity is something I'll, I'll come back and talk a little bit more later. Um, and, then, and then there's lots of other properties. And the question is, what are the other properties that you can encode? Uh, what other group theoretic properties can you encode by the graph? And um, in general, right, since we know that these graphs, um, the graphs, uh, isomorphism classes of graphs and isomorphism copies of groups are, are bijective. Um, a natural question to ask is like, what, is, what do random writing of Coxeter groups look like? Um, so you take, so what's a random writing of Coxeter group? You just generate a random graph in the erdos renyi model, and then you build a writing of Coxeter group associated to that. Um, and then we can ask questions like what happens for one of these random groups? And so, um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a model of random groups due to Gromov called the density model. Um, and in the Gromov density model, the random the random group is hyperbolic. So that that's kind of the um, and in fact there's several different models of of randomness. And in, in most of the models, uh, the random group is is hyperbolic. And so um, so so we can now kind of study uh, in this in this model that we're thinking about now how common is hyperbolicity. Okay. Um, so we have the criterion for hyperbolicity, this thing due to Musong. Um, so we know that hyperbolicity is equivalent to not containing any squares. Uh, and then, and then, um, so how do we figure out how common it is? Well, how many how many squares are there? Well, there's there's n choose four sets of four vertices, uh, and the probability that those four vertices connect up to form an induced square is exactly uh, p to the fourth times one minus p squared. Um, so the expected number of squares is roughly n to the fourth times p to the fourth times one minus p squared. Okay, so um, 
Well, so what does that get us? Well, um, you know, it's easy to check then that, so right, this is sort of a, Charney Farber were the first people to write this down. I hate to say it's easy to check, but, because um, uh, it's a theorem of theirs, but like, you know, this follows pretty quickly from the, the argument I just gave. So this is something that like would have been known to Erdős. Um, so a random writing of a Coxeter group is hyperbolic, asymptotically almost surely when n times p uh, goes to zero. Okay, so there's this kind of very simple criterion for recognizing when, um, when, a, when, a, when a random writing of a Coxeter group is hyperbolic. Okay, so, so in kind of, if P is less than one over N, then you know that you get something hyperbolic. So what happens otherwise? Okay, that, that's, 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 um, that's where we're kind of left with. Um, so, uh, so it turned out that, that sort of the next step is there's a theorem that I proved with, uh, with Mark Hagen and Alessandro Sisto, uh, and then it, well, and it's kind of combined with the theorem of Levkovich to prove that um, any writing of Coxeter group is in one of two categories. Either it has uh, exponential divergence, so these hyperbolic ones have exponential divergence, or it has exactly polynomial di divergence. Um, so the original theorem that, that me and my collaborators proved was that it has at most polynomial divergence, and the, but getting the kind of lower bounds is complicated, and that's what Lefkowitz proved. He proved actually that you get, that, that it's really striated, that you either have polynomial divergence of some fixed degree, or you have exponential. In general, divergence can be can be really like any function can be the divergence function of a finitely generated group. So there's things that are like super linear, but converge to linear. And there's, you know, there's things with X to the power square root of two, or sorry, you know, right, X to the power square root of two, that, that's also some divergence function. So you get lots of complicated divergence functions, but for writing a Coxeter group, they fit into these nice boxes. It's either exponential or it's, um, uh, or, or, or it's uh, exactly polynomial. And, um, and I should say that we, we prove a little bit more, which is um, the exponential divergence group. Um, so these correspond to, um, so these uh, correspond to what's called relative hyperbolicity. Okay, so, so I, I told you what hyperbolicity is. That means sort of all the triangles are very thin. Something that's relatively hyperbolic uh, the triangles don't have to all be thin, but th there's kind of, there, there may be some spaces, there may be these like large copies of Euclidean space where, where triangles are fat. Um, but those places where triangles are fat are kind of cabined off from each other. So they're kind of these very concrete, like small spots, which are separated from each other in some, in some very explicit way. Um, and so, so the exponential divergence ones are either hyperbolic or relatively hyperbolic, which means that the kind of hyperbolicity occur that they're sort of they're like hyperbolic in a very in a very explicit way. Um, so so that's what we proved, and actually we proved a little bit more, which is we proved that the rate of divergence can be determined in polynomial time from the combinatorics of the presentation graph. Um, and more explicitly, there's a very um, there's, you know there's an explicit kind of combinatorial way to detect exactly what the degree is of, of divergence, um, and a companion theorem to this is, is a theorem of, of Pauli, Donnie, and, and Ann Thomas, where they prove that every order of polynomial divergence occurs in some, um, in some writing, in some uh, one-ended writing of Coxeter group. Okay, so you can actually get every degree. So this, um, this shows that there's, that there are, you know, this, this, this explicitly is a bunch of nice counterexamples to this conjecture of Gromov's. Um, and it shows that every polynomial degree occurs and exponential occurs. So, so the question then is, well, you know, what's the most common, right? If you draw, if you take a, 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 a um, if you take a random right angle Coxeter group, what's its behavior gonna be? So, you know, an explicit question, um, you know, question, um, what about, you know, G and P? So do you expect it to be, do you expect it to be polynomial or exponential? Like that, like what sort of behavior, does anyone, does anyone have a wild guess? I'm curious if probably in the audience can sense what should happen. Okay, well, no, no one has the voice again, but, but anyways, people can, people can see what they, so I'll tell you what our first theorem was. So our first theorem was that G and one half, so, let me just say the smart money is that it should be exponential divergence because you know Gromov's theorem says everything is hyperbolic and and here 
well, everything's not hyperbolic. There's, there's also some relative hypervolicity, but that should be what happens. Um, but we proved that GN, but, but in GN one half asymptotically almost surely gives you polynomial divergence. So here's like a partial answer. Okay, but, but that just led to more questions, which is, which is you know, what, what happened, you know, can, can we get a bound on what that, on what the divergence is? We proved it's polynomial. Could we get an explicit bound on what it was? Maybe it goes to infinity, um, which is what we expected happened. Um, so we ran some computer simulations. And actually this was a great, this was a project where I got some undergraduates involved and they spent a summer programming and, and they started running these computations uh, for, you know, GN one half at sort of some large values of N and, and they kept getting the answer that thing, that everything was quadratic. They just, you know, they'd run the program and it would say quadratic, quadratic, quadratic. And, and, and you know, I was sure that this was sort of a, a you know, problem with their code. So I then sort of spent some time and, and wrote my own code to do this. Um, and it turned out that like their computations were right. So for GN one half, like in, in the bound, in the, in the, in the, you know, in the low complexity runs that we were able to do, uh, you always got quadratic divergence. And so actually uh, this then led with some more experimenting uh, to the following picture. So here's some more experimental um, data, uh, which I found very suggestive, right? So, so we, 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 we let the probability vary, you know, because for some reasons we sort of thought that alpha n to the minus one half might be at least the right order of magnitude of the threshold. And we started running. And so, you know, this is sort of a, a version uh, for quadratic divergence of this, of this graph that I showed earlier um, for, uh, for the erdos renyi theorem, right? You can see that there is, um, you know, you can see that, that, that the bands are not that tight, right? So these are kind of low numbers of vertices, uh, low numbers of vertices, but this took like 10,000 hours to run on a, on a you know, cluster of computers. So, um, so it took a very long time, but, but, but we could only get up to 1500 vertices, but you can see this suggestive picture that these lines are getting kind of quite steep um, and they seem to be converging to something. Um, uh, but, 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 you know, maybe that's just a failure. In fact, you know, the NSF proposal I submitted on this to the common targets group said, you know, you can't tell anything from, from these kind of experiments. It's too low values. So, um, so nonetheless, my collaborators and I were able to prove that this was the right order of magnitude actually for a threshold. Um, and then, and then with, with kind of a lot more work, we eventually were able to prove so with with um, Fog, with Victor Fogus robbery and Mark Hagen and and Tim Seuss actually in some it's a combination of papers um, you know, of two of our papers with with the, you know different co-authors on each one uh, we proved the following theorem we proved that there's a sharp threshold theorem for quadratic divergence um, so we proved that there's this explicit number which is the square root of the square root of six minus two. Uh, and that, and that, if you go above that at all, so if you if you go above that times n to the minus one half, then the random graph with with then you take the random graph with that with that um, you take the right angle Coxeter group with that random graph um, as its presentation graph, then that will always have quadratic divergence. And if you go below that, it always has at least cubic divergence. So there's this kind of there's this very concrete sharp threshold. Um, and and I should say that this, this number for us was kind of exciting because. Um, you know, well, for several reasons. Uh, so, so let me well, let me say actually let me say one other corollary first. So, one corollary corollary of this that I was very excited about is that Gromov's conjecture, even though we knew it was false, like the question was how false is it? Well, it fails for random random coxeter groups. So that was pretty exciting. There's this kind of very concrete threshold, and we can show that you know there's not just one weird example that someone could construct. There's like you know the random graph um, gives you uh, gives you a, a counterexample to his conjecture. Um, so that was exciting. Uh, the other thing that was exciting is that this number actually shows up in a, in a paper of uh, Bolibosch and Riordan. So they were interested in what's called click percolation, which is you study, um, you take a random graph, uh, and, then, and then you build sort of cliques in that random graph, and then you connect two cliques if they coincide along a sub -cleak. Um So this gives you some kind of related graph, which is no longer um, which no longer has independence between the edges. So there's lots of dependence here. Um, and they were interested in understanding when that had a giant component. Um, and they proved that that had a giant component for quick percolation. And, and they did, um, they, and then they, they had this kind of end of their paper where they've got a bunch of um, other 
versions of quick percolation that you might do. And, and for about six pages, they go on and they go, hey, we can prove this, we can prove this. Like, these are all these other things that we don't want to write down that you can prove. And then they're like, okay, but there's some hard cases, which are like, suppose you take a cycle and then you want to do percolate and then you want to kind of do something similar with that cycle. So the simplest case of that, it turns out, is the case where you have a four cycle. So you have uh, induced square. Um, and then you want to you build some, some associated graph and then you want to know if that has a giant component. And they said, this we don't know how to do, and we think that it's probably complicated. Like we have some ideas, but, but it seems very technically hard to do. And it turns out that we can exactly answer their question um, with this solution. So we also kind of answer this Boley, Bosch, and Rorden question um, along the way. So um, I actually have 14 more pages of slides, but I think I'm out of time and, and I've kind of stated the main theorem. So, so maybe I'll stop there and, and you know, I'm on sabbatical and happy to travel. So if anyone wants more details, I'm happy to, <laughs> to come give them. Or if any, there's any questions now, I'm happy to answer them. So. OK, uh, thank you very much. So maybe a start uh, a round of applause first and then the questions. <laughs> OK, so question time. If you have some, feel free to unmute or raise hand or write it in the chat. I have a question. Um, evidently, you have a method to decide whether it has quadratic convergence, uh, uh, and you can decide this with some algorithm that allowed you to do the computation. So what is that method? Okay, thank you for asking. So, um, so, so, let me, so let me actually, I have the answer on my next slide, um, which is we have this, uh, this thing called the square graph. Um, so this is kind of our analog of of what Bolobosch and Rorden had done in quick percolation, which is we build an associated graph. Um, so that graph has um, a vertex for every induced force cycle. And, and you know, a lot of you know, people that think about random graphs know that induced is often hard to deal with, but we, have, but we want a, vertices for induced force cycles. Um, and then we put edges uh, for, uh, for pairs of these, you know, called, I just call them squares. So for each pair of squares, whose overlap contains a diagonal. So I think I even have a um, explicit picture here. Here's, here's the graph I drew earlier and um, uh, that I said was a three manifold graph that came from the fundamental group of a three manifold. And like, here's one square and here's another square and they overlap along um, a diagonal, in fact, more than a diagonal. So you would connect those in this graph. Um, so that gives you, that gives you some, um, that gives you some graph. And then uh, um, a graph is called CFS constructed from squares, if you look at components of the square graph, and when you write down those components, you, you don't just write down the squares, but you write down kind of, you remember the vertices they came from. And the question is, is there a component of the square graph that, that, that contains every vertex of the original graph? Um, and, and so, um, it, so it, you're constructed from squares if there's some component that labels every vertex in the original graph. And so you can kind of imagine, you know, we have a, um, like a, a wall, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, an evolutionary process that allows you to kind of explore the graph in this sort of way, um, you know, th th through these kind of, you know, through moving from one force cycle to the other along these edges. Um, and so this is the criterion. So in fact, do I even write this on my slide? So the theorem of Lebkowitz is that, is that this gives you, um, this gives you the criterion for exactly when uh, your graph has quadratic divergence. And I say, if it's not a join, if it's a join, it has linear divergence. So this is the criterion for having at most quadratic divergence. Um, but, but, but it quickly turns into one for exactly quadratic divergence. Um, okay. So uh, so uh, time uh, to check this for a, a particular random sample. Sorry. So, yeah, so we can check this. Um, yeah, but I'm yeah, saying so we can check this. It took a lot, lot of time to run. Is it because it takes a long time to check if the graph is constructed from squares? Yeah. So I guess it takes, so it takes a while to check this. Um, I guess when I was running those, we were actually checking. So there's also a combinatorial criterion for whether it has divergence polynomial. Well, we used to have a criterion for whether it had polynomial divergence of degree at most n. And it turns out that there's a theorem, a recent theorem of Lebkowitz, which allows you to, in terms of a hypergraph, allows you to compute exactly when a, when a graph has divergence exactly uh, degree n. Uh, it has, has quadratic divergence, sorry, has polynomial divergence of degree exactly n. And so, yeah, so, so the full check takes some time, but even actually just, even the quadratic one takes quite a bit of time. Um, okay, cool. I should actually look, can I, let me, um, let me ask myself a question and then um, put up a nice slide that shows it. So let me just show, here, here's a picture. 
here's some more computational evidence of something slightly different, which is um, this is the picture of uh, we ran uh, I ran this other soft I, I ran this code that allows you to compute exactly when something has divergence of order um, of, of order you know x to the n for for any value of n and um, and uh, so I did that on a bunch of random graphs um, at, at particular values of you know particular p values so again I wanted this kind of keep this constant the same and let them be n to the minus one half um, so remember this was the threshold the threshold for uh, quadratic divergence occurs at this order, but I, I actually kind of conjecture that, um, my, well, I have a conjecture that, that for any polynomial degree, if you vary the constant, you get a different, you get a different, um, uh, you know, you get a different order of divergence. And so, um, you know, there's, I, I found this, I found this picture just surprisingly striking of kind of how closely these at least seem to, to kind of, you know, um, you know, bind together as a family. And, and, um, you know, I mean, my kind of dream conjecture at this point is that there's really like a double jump theorem and that like, if you go, if you go in order of magnitude beneath this, you should just get exponential divergence. But right at these constant times n to the minus one half is where you get every polynomial degree as you vary the constant. And then above that, you know, and then, and then above that, we have all quadratic. Uh, um, right. So, so below is exponential, above is quadratic. And kind of as you vary that constant, you get different polynomials. That's my conjecture at the present. I've been trying to, you know, we have sort of a, some ideas towards proving that, but it seems, well, anyway, ongoing work. Um, okay, other questions? Uh, so I see Andres. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Andres. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Uh, cool. uh, my question relates, I hope I'm heard, that um, you relate the um, uh, Erdos-Schrein graphs to right angled coxeter groups. Would it be, I mean, is what is the intuition say not to connect it to general coxeter groups or even to R10 groups? Would this be possible? And uh, what would change in the results in the derivations? Got it, good question. So, so, let, let, so let me, um, I'll answer in two parts. So one is, um, one is uh, you could ask about Arden groups. And so Arden groups are sort of similar presentations as Coxeter groups, except in six, if you don't have the two. So your order, so your generators are infinite order instead of finite order. Um, if you if you ask the same question about right angled Arden groups, then it turns out that I've got a theorem with Ruth Charney from like 10 or 15 years ago, where we proved that every right angled Arden group has either linear or quadratic divergence. Um, so we kind of knew exactly what it, so there was nothing between quadratic and exponential there. Um, you know, the only exponential ones come from free products. So they're of a very, fine, a very kind of simple form. And really everything is linear and quadratic if you have a connected presentation graph. So if you're, if you're not a free product of something, then you're, then it's linear quadratic. Um, so those we already understood. So why writing a Coxeter group and that general Coxeter group? Well, be, because exactly that, so there's a way to, so the same way I drew a graph and then I, and then I wrote down the presentation, um, that graph had each edge correspond to, um, to correspond to commuting. So if you want to write down a presentation for an arbitrary uh, Coxeter group, you could do the same thing, but then you have to put labels on those edges telling you, okay, I want to take the, I want to take the product of these two things to the nth power. And I want to make that the identity. And the sort of the theory of random graphs with labels is, um, I mean, as you guys all know, I think much better than me, it, it, it's much more, you know, it's much less clear about how to put the labels on and much more dependent on, uh, you know, on some nuanced set of choices as opposed to kind of just this general erdos renyi theorem, which doesn't have any labels. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I had one, uh, just one question about uh, what uh, some word from graph theory means. Uh, I don't know what a join is actually. Uh, Oh, good. Uh, so a join just means uh, you take all the, you take, you have some collection of vertices here and you have some collection of vertices here and you put edges between every vertex on the left side and every vertex on the right side. Okay, so it's like a complete bipartite. Uh, yeah, complete bipartite. Okay, yeah, exactly. it's, uh, yeah, like a click on complete graph. It's just two words from, uh, for the same. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, right, good. I, right. see, I see Pierre Mathieu has a question. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering, is there, a way you could know, prove that you have a rather, rather sharp threshold without 
knowing the exact value of the lambda c. I mean, something like uh, an a priori concentration result or influence inequality or something like this. Well, so um, so I don't know, you know, so I, I'm kind of, my day job is, is a geometric group theorist and low dimensional topologist. So, um, so you guys might have better techniques than me for this. Um, I mean, I, I have to say that the, the sharp threshold actually took us a lot of work and is very technical. Um, although it introduced a bunch of new ideas that I think are useful for other people that want to study um, graphs that have some dependencies. Like I think there's not a lot of tools for that and we developed some tools for that. Um, but that was actually the second, well, really the third in a series of papers. In the second paper, we prove an order of magnitude result. So we proved that, you know, in, we took the epsilon and we put it in the exponent. We proved that if you were above n to the one half plus epsilon, then you had one behavior. And if you were below n to the one half minus epsilon, then you had different behavior. And, and so, so the order of magnitude result was quite a bit easier, um, but it wasn't uh, but it wasn't sort of a general nonsense theorem. But if, if there is some kind of general theorem that easily gives that, um, I'd love to know about it. So if you have suggestions, I'm happy to look at them. And I mean, I'd be curious um, because for instance, we're still trying to prove, you know, we don't know what happens at any of these higher orders. Um, and, and, um, and what's really interesting to know is what the threshold is for the exponential divergence, because that has to do with when, when groups are relatively hyperbolic, which has a whole lot of other structure theory associated with it. So, so I don't know, I've got some good bounds, but I don't know what the sharp bound is for when uh, exponential divergence uh, begins. And I don't know for any degree higher than two when you get, when you get polynomial degree n. Thanks. But, 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 I, but, I, but I'm interested, to, like, you know, I'm very happy to give this into a, to this talk to a bunch of people that I've never seen before because you guys all know things that I don't know. And I would love to talk with anybody about, about using some of your ideas to prove some of the results that I'm interested in or using some of the things that I've developed to apply to other ideas. And actually, can I just put up one more? I'm going to put up one more slide that I put at the very end um, just because I think it's kind of a cool picture, um, which is, um, so here's a, here's a picture of, um, which looks like a brain and, and it turns out that it like, it is a brain. So, so those vertices each represent, uh, sort of neurons in the brain. And so this is data from the human connectome project. So I took the graph and, and rather than just asking, does it satisfy this connect, this CFS property that I was interested in, you know, often if graphs don't satisfy that property, that's the property that gives me quadratic divergence. Often if they don't satisfy that, you can ask what are the components that are spanned by the square graph? Um, so even if they're not every, if they're everything, that's something interesting, but even if they're not, it might pick out various structures. And so in this case, like it picked out these kind of, it broke the brain up into these sort of three different components. And so, you know, there's a lot of, I know in graph theory, there's a lot of places where people want to have various structure theorems. So like in the quick percolation world, they're kind of interested in like, what are the various cliques? And in social media worlds, they're interested in like, what do these various components look like? And so this is kind of a, you know, this is sort of a, a combinatorial way that comes from geometric group theory to pick out components or sometimes people call these modules within, within a graph. And so this might have real world applications. I've tried to get biologists interested in this and I kind of got some, but then not enough traction yet. But I think that there's some like real world applications of this. And I think there might also be theoretical applications of this. Um, and I would love to see if anybody has ideas and wants to, wants to implement this type of thing or think about this type of thing. I, I'm, I'm really curious about how this plays out. Um, okay, great. Is it your brain? <laughs> no, it's not my brain. So there's this human connection project, which has like, you know, it has like 40 different brains that, that are, or the, they may even be like eigen brains where they, you know, connect a bunch of, they, they collect a bunch of data, but you can download this off the internet and then you can sort of search through different brains and you can run them in different ways. And, and um, I get this. So there's a couple of hands up. Um, Marek, is that? Uh, thank you for talk. Uh, I, I like two talks, but uh, we working on Coxeter group and Coxeter uh, Kelly graphs in the spirit of amenability, for example, or co uh, cash down property. So random walks are important. So, for example, some people prove when Coxeter group, of course, infinity uh, is amenable. This is connected that spectral radius is one. If from all result, I, I couldn't see, but maybe this is easy to see at once that uh, 
amenability is because that class is very simple. If I, I understand this is a fine Coxeter group extension by finite, something like this. Did, did, did you can say something? If, because your result is more or less about hyperbolic group. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Oh, but, but, uh, for example, we prove with the Anushkevich Kajdan property is not hold for the Coxeter group infinite. But you can, from your consideration, also obtain this result. The Kajdan means that trivial representation is isolated, or maybe it's some, also some random graph business. This will be interesting. Yes. We also have another uh, problems when we work connection with, with the operator, or PZA business operator, especially. So. But these two questions will be for me interesting. If your result, you can obtain at least amenability, characterization, Coxeter groups, and also why we prove explicitly, we, we prove that, that uh, trivial representation is not isolated because Q to the length function for Q is zero one is positive definite. And then we found, but this was curious. It should be some uh, nice proof or some understanding more. Right, so, so, so I don't, off the top of my head, have an answer to the amenability question. In terms of the, uh, the, the property T question, I mean, in the right angle world, right angle Coxeter groups always act um, they act probably just continuously co-compactly on non-positively curved cube complexes. So none of them, none of them have property T. So, so there's no property T in any, for the, any of the examples that I showed. Um, mm -hmm. um, I don't I know see. why it keeps jumping to that slide, but, um, mm -hmm. okay. but, but, but yeah, I, so, so, but yeah, relation to eigenvalues of the Laplacian, like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't quite know. Um, it would, it would because, be interesting to know. Because Kasdan yeah. property is connected with the, what you mentioned here, some some cohomology business or something like this. Did you can apply this or uh, would be right? Well, no, but, right. So that's what I was saying. So none of these have Kajdan property T. I mean, I none of these are Kajdan because they all act to come back on cube complexes. I see. Um, I see. So, so yeah, in the right angle Coxeter, in the right angle Coxeter world, because of the fact that they're built in this nice way, you can build these cube complexes out of them, and acting on those is an obstruction to having Kajdan property T. So none of them have Kajdan property T, um, but um, but 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 as far as amenability, I, I think it sort of doesn't show up in this in this context. I think because because we are dealing with these very hyperbolic examples. Um, but but I haven't thought about that explicitly. Anyway, thank you once more for both talks. Uh, I had not asked this, uh, Raz, but but also was very interesting for me. Thank you very much. Okay, so I guess these are nice uh, conclusive words. So <laughs> we can thank uh, both speakers again. <laughs>